Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we study the, seventh, the, Advent, the Sabbath school classes as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is the beginning of a new series on the book of James. This whole next 13 Sabbaths, we'll be talking about uh, details from that small book in the New Testament, and of course comparing it with uh, materials from other parts of the Bible. This lesson is the lesson we'll be studying for October 4 of 2014. And you might guess that as we begin the book of James, we would ta want to talk about the author. And the title of our lesson is, uh, lesson is entitled, James, the Lord's Brother. And there's a lot of things we can learn about him that are not widely known. So that will be our challenge in our lesson for today. We need to begin, however, with a word of prayer because we certainly need the Lord's guidance as we study this material. Our kind and loving Father, we turn to you now and ask that you will guide us as we consider the materials that are presented before us, as we think about the people who lived many years ago and wish that we could more clearly understand and see them and the environment in which they live. Help us to understand them as far as possible and understand why they wrote, to whom they wrote, etc., so that we may better understand the scriptures as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I wish I had a time machine and we could all just jump in and go back a couple thousand years and see what it was like in the days of Jesus and the way, days of these early disciples. We're going to suggest to you that this James might have known Jesus very well. Let's see what we can learn about him in, in this lesson. Um, so since we can't go back in a time machine, what do we do? Well, the best choice is to look at other writings from the time period, compare other stories of things that happened at that time, to see if we can understand the situation to the best of our ability. So think about, now our focus is going to be on the first decade or two decades after the death of Jesus. This is the time when the Christian church was really struggling to get its footing, to survive against Jewish opposition. If you remember in AD 34, immediately after Stephen was stoned, as described, remember his sermon is in Acts 7, and then the first verse of, of Acts 8, it talks about Paul was there, he was a part of, or Saul, he was at that time, was there as a part of it, and then it says immediately there was a terrible persecution. What was the result? They all scattered. The, most of the Christians scattered. And what did they do as they scattered? Spread the word. Yeah, where they went, they... But who were they talking to? Do you remember? Remember, as they scattered, they spread the gospel only to Jews. Yes. Wherever they went, they tried to become a part of the local Jewish communities. They started to evangelize the Jewish communities until something very remarkable happened that we don't study about very much. I've, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon about this. It's found in Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 19. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and you, would, you wouldn't be surprised at that. Those were major Jewish communities telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, okay, all you ancient geographers, where is Cyrene? Hmm. Libya. That's, right. That's part of what the current country of Libya. So we got an, a Christian missionary coming from Libya to Antioch, and where is Antioch located? Syria. In Syria. So now we've got a Christian missionary coming from Libya to Syria to spread the gospel. And notice what happened. They went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, you might not immediately recognize it, but this was a major, major turning point for the gospel. Okay? 
And what was the result? Well, when the people down in Jerusalem heard about this, that, God, that a bunch of Gentiles were joining the church without becoming completely Judaized first, they got a little bit concerned and they sent Barnabas up there to investigate. And what did Barnabas do? He said, this is wonderful, let's join in. And he started evangelizing more Jews and Gentiles. And pretty soon he says, there's too much work here, I can't handle it all. There must be someone around here who can help me. And who did he go and find? Paul. Paul was in, Tar in Tarsus only a short distance away. He traveled over there and said, Paul, you've been in obscurity for about 10 years. It's time to come out and get to work. And boy, did they ever. And the gospel began to just explode. And um, this is where we are. We, we're thinking about that particular time. Now, remember, down in Jerusalem, there's this very devout group of Christians, but they're Jews and they're sure. Many of them were Pharisees. Some of them were Sadducees or had been Pharisees and Sadducees, had become Christians. And they were, they were quite certain that God wanted everybody who was going to become a Christian to be a Jew first. But they had that, that idea sort of shaken up a little bit by something that had happened to Peter. Do you remember what it was? Yes, they had the dream. The dream of the sheet coming down. From yeah. The and what did he do as a result of that? Well, he didn't know what to make of it quite first, but ultimately he, he, he went the same way as Barnabas did. Yeah, he went, Peter went up there with lots of witnesses because he knew what was going to happen when he went back to Jerusalem with a lot of witnesses to the house of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. I mean, talk about craziness. You know, you go to spread the gospel to a Roman centurion, and um, we know that the entire family received the Holy Spirit. They were baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And Peter went back to Jerusalem. He says, I don't know what you brethren are going to say, but here's all my witnesses. We went there and they received the Holy Spirit just like we did. So it must have been, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it must be something besides just, okay, I believe. Yeah. I mean, you could actually bring somebody over and see it's happening. So there, there must have been some change in people yep. when that came. It may have spread all over, over the world, it may even still have an effect now. And yet we don't know exactly what they saw. Mm-hmm. Well, while all this was happening, the church in Jerusalem was being headed up by a certain man that we call James. What do we know about this guy? He was the Bishop of Jerusalem, wasn't he? He came to be called the Bishop of Jerusalem, yes. Uh, in, in Greek, for those of you who are scared by the term bishop, the word bishop comes from episkopos, which of course is the origin of our word Episcopalian, in Greek, episkopos just means an elder. That, that's an old, uh, a leader, an elder. Uh, so don't let that scare you. But the man's real name was Jacob. And the crazy thing is this, that all the Jacobs in the New Testament, apparently someone translating, as far as I know, only into English. I don't think this happened in any other language. Only in English, they decided that there were too many Jacobs in the Bible, so the Old Testament would, would, would leave all the Old Testament people, call them Jacob, because we can't change that. We don't want to change that. But all the Jacobs in the New Testament, they just arbitrarily said, we're going to call him James. So his name was not James at all. It was Jacob. Jacobo in, 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 in the original Aramaic or Hebrew. Does that kind of lose the meaning of the word Jacob when you go to James? What does Jacob mean? Well, it means a supplanter, a heel grabber, something like that. Heel grabber? <laughs> yeah, that's what it meant back in the beginning. Yeah. Remember, he came oh, out holding up. his brother's heel? That's yeah, right. yeah, that's right. Supplanter, some people say. So why was that name so important, <laughs> so popular? Well, of course, he was, he was, you know, he was the leader of the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, you know, he's like George Washington. Yeah, but there's a lot of other names in the Bible, too, that were... Well, but, I mean, you could imagine that someone I mean, who... They didn't even call him Jacob after a while. They called him Israel, right? Yeah. So, 
what's the deal? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're just like, and his brother was named Joseph, mm -hmm. guess what? You know, so, well, we have to identify this. We need to be careful when we, when we, do, we talk about this kind of stuff. There were four people in the New Testament, four men in the New Testament, which m now go by the name of James. The first one was James, the father of Judas, not, the, not Judas Iscariot, but another Judas, one of the disciples. Almost certainly he was not the James who became a church leader. There was James the apostle, the son of Alphaeus. Now, we know nothing else about him, basically. There was James the apostle, the son of Zebedee, and brother to John the apostle, who was martyred. And, and that James, what happened to him? Acts 12, just move, reading on a little bit further in your Bible, about this time King Herod began to persecute some members of the church. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw, this, saw that this pleased the Jews, he went on to arrest Peter and so forth. And you remember, Peter was miraculously uh, released from prison. But that was, that was, before that happened, James, the brother of John, was, was put to death by the sword. So he's out of the picture. And that leaves James, the brother of our Lord. And what do we know about Jesus' family? They had several brothers. Well, look at Matthew 13, starting with verse, well, to get the context here a little bit, we should really start, when Jesus finished telling these parables, he left that place and went, I'm starting with verse 53, went back to his hometown. He taught in the synagogue and those who heard him were amazed. Where did he get such wisdom, they asked. And what about his miracles? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? Aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? Where are the sisters? What do we know about Jesus' sisters? A big fat zero. Where did he get? And, and the other two uh, brothers, uh, uh, Simon and Judas. I'm sorry, Joseph and Simon, I guess are the ones we don't know anything about. We know about the first one, James, and Judas, the last one. And so they rejected him. Now, it's <laughs> important to say, to remember that they're stepbrothers. They're not yes, really... Half We're going to talk about that in a moment. Or half-brothers, yeah. Well, not even half-brothers. Uh, well, it says, uh, Joseph did not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus. Did they ever have any kids together, Mary? And well, we're going to talk about that, Okay. Um, you should say that pretty quickly from the experience I had <laughs> talking about Jesus' brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> brother. Um, well, let's look at that. Uh, there are two common reasons why we believe that James and his brothers and sisters were older than Jesus. Here are the two reasons. While on the cross, Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to John, his beloved disciple. Some people would say that James and John, the two disciples, were actually Jesus' cousins. We don't know that for sure, but there's some evidence for that. I don't have time to talk about that right now. But you can read about that in John 19, 26, and 27. This would have been very unlikely if Mary had other children. It really wouldn't have been appropriate for him to say, John, and, and Ellen White goes on to say that John took care of her for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. If she had a bunch of other children, that wouldn't be appropriate. And then in Mark 3, 21 and 31, let's look at those verses. Mark 3.21, when his family heard about it, Jesus was baptizing and he was healing. I mean, he wasn't baptizing, his disciples were baptizing. He was, he was healing people and he was preaching to large crowds. When his family heard about it, they set out to take charge of him. Well, what they heard was that the, the Pharisees were trying to downplay his ability to work miracles and they were claiming that Jesus was working miracles by the power of the devil. And his family, of course, didn't want that kind of reputation. So they, they set out uh, when the family heard about it, they set out to take charge of him because people were saying he's gone mad. Well, in, in, in Oriental custom, you don't take charge of an older brother, an older anybody. The older ones always take priority over the younger ones. So, and then if you drop down to verse 31, it says, Then Jesus' the mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside the house and sent in a message asking for him. A crowd was sitting around. They actually sent in a message telling him to come out. And what did Jesus say? 
crowd were sitting around Jesus, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside. They want you. Jesus answered, Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? He looked at the people sitting around him and said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does what God wants him to do is my brother and my sister and my mother. Superficially, that might seem a little disrespectful. But what would have happened if Jesus had allowed his mother and his brothers to take charge of his program? Can't do that. What? Would have ruined it. Yeah. So when it says his brothers were out there, do you think one of them was James? Yeah, of course. Okay. So who were these brothers? Well, would, they would have to have been Joseph. Joseph's children by a, a previous marriage. Mm -hmm. So then he later married Mary, and Jesus was their only child. Was her only child? So. Even though they were a blended family, if we use a modern term, they weren't related really in any way. And look at this. Look at John 7, verse, starting with verse 2. Here's another example. The time for the festival of shelters was near, so Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave this place and go to Judea so that your followers will see the things that you're doing. What are they trying to do? Manipulate him. They're trying to tell him what to do. You, oriental custom, you do not, younger brothers don't come along and tell an older brother what to do. So you think he didn't go just because they did that? And no, no. And waited for a while and said, no, well, no, now I'll go. Okay. <laughs> you need to understand what's going on here. Yeah. When the, there were three major festivals in Judaism every year. Mm -hmm. And when people went to these festivals, it was a week-long journey to get there and a week-long journey to get back. And it was a, it was the vacation, it was the big party time. Well, I mean, it was, you know, they were walking every day, but it was huge groups of people together, and this was their time to talk and so forth. If Jesus had joined one of those groups, there would have been a great hullabaloo, a great buildup. They would have been determined to try to make him king when he got to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened the last time he went to Jerusalem when they, when they were sure, you know, here's the king, he's ready to take over the throne on that Sunday, you know, morning when he, when he rode the donkey into town. So Jesus said, this is too early for that. But he actually went later by a secret route and got there and participated in some things at the, but he said, I can't have you telling me what to do. So why did his family not believe in him? I mean, you would have thought somebody living with that kind of a person for 30 years, you would say, wow, I mean, shouldn't, you have, shouldn't they have been impressed by his character, by his behavior, by his... Yeah. Well, there's, there's some evidence that he was doing well religiously even when he was younger. Yes. So it may have been a show that they expected after a while. I don't know. Okay, but I, I won't say that. Why wouldn't they have believed in him if that was the case? Believed in him? Mm -hmm. it, you would have thought Mary would have remembered, and maybe she did. Chances are she was overruled being a woman, the way things yeah. were then. Yeah. Did she, when you say, um, why didn't they believe in him, do you think Jesus wasn't really proclaiming who he was during that time yet, was he? No. Well, um, so we, I guess you're asking why didn't they just kind of go along with the whole thing and, yeah, well, and I mean, hold words, their hands and say, isn't this cool? Yeah, after they, had, <laughs> after they knew him all these years, when he started his ministry, you would have thought, wow, you know, here's the hometown hero, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of my uh, good friends, his brother is one of the nicest guys I know, mm -hmm. and everyone thinks so, but if you ask his brother... <laughs> I said growing up with him. I mean, so there might be something to do with that. Yeah. When you grow up with someone. A little sibling rivalry, yeah. maybe. That's true. Well, here's what Ellen White says. Desire of Ages, page 485 and 46. It was a false conception of the Messiah's work and a lack of faith in the divine character of Jesus that had led his brothers to urge him to present himself publicly to the people at the Feast of Tabernacles. What does that mean? I'll never try. They're, they're obviously repetitively trying to capitalize on him. Okay. 
Most of more? the people in his village would have remembered him purely as a carpenter's apprentice. Yeah. And but on the other hand, that you wonder if he obviously learnt the scriptures very well very early. Yes. And we know he uh, frequented synagogues regularly. So somebody must have realized there was more going on there than just being a carpenter. Yeah. Well, think about it now. What happened here is probably his brothers had a, a regular rabbinic education. You were, everybody was supposed to get that kind of education. Jesus didn't. But they were so determined, they so much believed that the Messiah, I'm using that term in quotation marks, the Messiah was going to be the general who would come and lead the armies and drive out the Romans and conquer them. Like, and this kid, you know, this guy who's so, you know, so meek and mild and so on, there's no way he can be a Messiah, you know. You know just think about it. You know, their, what was wrong was their idea about what the Messiah was supposed to do. And I repeat a very sad story. It was and still is so difficult to change a person's paradigm. To have it, a, someone who is accustomed to thinking in a certain way, to get them to change the way they think is a real challenge. And that's used to be the, what was the problem with, with um, his family. Well, then something happened. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I'm going to start with verse 3. I passed on to you, this is Paul now speaking, I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins as written in the scriptures, that he was buried, then he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter, and then to all 12 apostles, that would be in the upper room, remember. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once. That's in the, in the book of John. And most of, most of whom are still uh, actually in Matthew, I think, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterwards to all the apostles. Why do you suppose Paul specifically mentions his appearance to James? gives a link, somewhat of a link, and Christ, knowing the future, would have realized that he needed to make sure that his brother knew he was up and running, for want of a better term. Okay, now I want to read you what should be, to everyone, almost a shocking verse. Talking about the disciples now, as they're ready, getting ready for Pentecost. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women, and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. What happened? I mean, let, let, let's, let's be honest now. I have a friend who says that, you know, he, he smiles every time he sees someone wearing a cross. I mean, it's like someone in our day wearing a big t-shirt with an electric chair on it, you know. The, the cross was sub intended to be the worst kind of torture and death that you could inflict upon someone because he's a traitor to the Roman government. That's what the cross was supposed to be. See? The worst kind of torture and affliction you could, you could put to somebody. So, what, I mean, think about that. If, if one of us had a close relative that ended up in the electric chair, would we go out and say, Hooray, hooray, hooray. I mean, what would we do? Pretend like we didn't know them? Yeah. I mean, what would you expect people to do? Well, do you think everything was pointing to that execution thing, or was it pointing to his path to it? Well, I mean, we could discuss that for a long time, and that's a good question. And, and we, you know that there's, uh, you're talking about huge paradigms here. There are many Christians who believe that the only thing that really matters about Christ's entire life is the fact that he actually died, and the fact that he died pays for my sins. That's the only thing that really matters about the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. Others of us believe that there's a lot more involved in his, that we should learn from his life, and, and it's, all, it's not about the fact that somebody's paying a price, but it's something we, 
we're supposed to be learning from his life and his death and so forth. And that's what is important about all that. Um, so, now let me ask you the, the question in light of what we've just discussed. Shouldn't his brothers have disowned him? Or pretended like they didn't know him? What? And, and give up show business? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to this oldest brother of his? Let's look at a few verses. Look at Acts 12, 16 and 17. Meanwhile, now this is going back to the story of Peter when he was secretly uh, uh, released from prison. Meanwhile, Peter kept on knocking. Remember, he, he was led through the streets by the angel. Finally, the angel disappeared, and he found his way to the upper room, and he kept knocking on the door. At last, they opened the door, and when they saw him, they were amazed. He motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and he explained to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell this to James and the rest of the believers, he said. Then he left and went somewhere else. Why would he say, tell it to James? Well, he must have he had a change of heart, a real change of heart, seen, seen kind of in a similar situation to Peter in a way. Peter was a loud mouth, but finally the penny dropped, and I think the older brother had something similar. Yeah. Well, look at Acts 15. We're, we're looking at some places where the name James appears. Look at Acts 15, starting with verse 13. Now here they are at the first general conference. Remember they were discussing about whether or not Gentiles should be allowed into the church without being, becoming, going through all the rites of being a Jew. When they finished speaking, James spoke up. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. Simon has just explained how God first showed his care for the Gentiles, da 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 da. And he's giving a conclusion. Who is the person who usually gives, stands up and gives a conclusion? Isn't that the leader of the group? I was going to say somebody in The charge. president. Yeah. And then a few verses later, verse 19, it is my opinion, James went on, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. He's giving the final opinion. I mean, this guy is acting like the president, or the, at least the leader of the group, right? Mm -hmm. And then look at Galatians 1, 18 and 19. It was three years later, now this is Paul talking again, it was three years later that I went to Jerusalem to obtain information from Peter, and I stayed with him for two weeks. It did, I did not see any other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. What does that tell you? Um, Sounds like he's in charge, doesn't it? Yeah. And look at v chapter 2, verse 9. James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be the leaders, recognized that God had given me this special test. Now, this is not James and John as for James and John from as one of the disciples, because the James who is John's brother has already been killed. So, who who is this James? Well, the one we've been talking about, pretty sure, right? And his name was mentioned first. What does that suggest? Most important. He's the most important. So what we have is a picture of this James being the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Assuming then that this James is the older brother of Jesus, what evidence is there that he was the author of the book of James? Now we have the other side of the question. Why would we believe he's the author of the book? Because um, his name's on it? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a start, isn't it? He's <laughs> right up front. He says, I, well, no, look at just James 1.1. 1, 1. From James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, greetings to all God's people scattered over the whole world. He doesn't have to identify himself in any way. What does that mean? He's well known. He's known. I, uh, I have to tell you a funny story that will sort of highlight this idea. You know, we just assume that every, if the higher you are up in authority or the higher you are up in and public service or something else. Everybody's supposed to know who you are, right? Well, way back in the depths of World War I, when things were really bad at the end, the United States had sent a bunch of troops over there and things were really in bad shape. The president was really, I mean, he hardly ever even smiled. He was so concerned about what was going on. So Will Rogers, you remember the famous humorist, um, was, was invited to come to Washington and maybe meet the president, 
say something to try, try to cheer him up a little bit. And so back in those days, one of the guys who brought Will Rogers to, to there said, he told Will Rogers, he says, okay, I'll give you $100. And that was a lot of money in those days. I will give you $100 if you can get the president to smile. And so, you know, here, so he's being introduced to all these senators and other people, and he's down, going down the line, and he's shaking everybody's hand, and so forth. He's Will Rogers. And finally, he comes to the president, and they introduce him. He says, so he's shaking the president's hand. He says, excuse me, I didn't get the name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you expect, <laughs> and of course, he got his hundred dollars. You could, yeah. you, you can, you can, you can imagine. So James just expects everybody to know who he is. Okay. Again, what does that imply? He's known and respected. Yeah. Two, the author declined to call himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't claim to be a disciple or even an apostle, because, and, and Peter and Paul did that. They clearly identified themselves as apostles. James doesn't. Then a very interesting thing that is hard for us to understand, but I will just mention this, and if someone really wants to know more information, uh, you can look it up. There's very striking similarities between the vocabulary of the letter which James was responsible for writing back in Acts 15, when he was talking about, we're writing this letter to the Gentiles telling you, you don't have to become a Jew and so forth. And that short letter, there are very striking similarities between that short, the vocabulary in that short letter and the vocabulary in the book of James. An interesting point. Mm -hmm. Four, the emphasis of the letter of James, it seems to be on religious piety and living the religious life. This is consistent with extra biblical materials talking about James, the Bishop of Jerusalem. See, for example, if you want to look this up, Eusebius, who lived 100 years or so later, in the, in the book entitled Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, uh, Section 23, Paragraphs 1 through 25. There's a whole section about James and his work and so forth. So now let's, let's talk about that. What is James' emphasis in his writings? Um, one thing doing, might be doing work. Doing works. Yeah. Well, and basically he's talking about how to live the Christian life. Right, he's not right. talking about, like Paul, his emphasis is how to become a Christian. No. What are the steps in becoming a Christian? No, James is talking about two things. One, how to live the Christian life, and there thereby how, to, how to, to worship in peace with other Christians. So he's talking about sort of the organization within the church and what's, what needs to go on within the church. Number five, in this letter, the author spoke with an authoritative tone which would be appropriate for the bishop of, of Jerusalem. And there's a whole lot of commands in this little book. Do this, do that, do, do, like you would expect a, a church leader to, to do. So therefore... Based on that, most scholars accept that these reasons are sufficient enough to believe that James, the stepbrother of Jesus, remember he's the son of Joseph, not the son of Mary. Jesus was the son of Mary, but not the son of Joseph, so they weren't blood-related in any way. But they believe he was later the bishop or elder of Jerusalem, and that he was the one who wrote this book. So, a couple more things. Uh, where is James found in the Bible? The book of James? Right after Hebrews. Right after Hebrews. What does that tell you? It's a small book. And it's a small one, book? Something wasn't written by Paul. Wasn't written by Paul? <laughs> There's something else about it. Well, it's kind of a universal letter. Wasn't okay, he's, he's not writing to a single individual or a single church. He doesn't say to the Galatians. He doesn't say to Timothy like Paul's letters or to Titus or something like this. It's written to a whole group of all... Of, Apparently, like all an churches. Encyclical. Yeah. It, a sort of encyclical. Followers of multitudinous churches. What do we call letters that are written to the whole, all the churches? Catholic. Catholic. They're called Catholic letters. Now, that doesn't mean it have anything to do with the Roman Catholic Church. No. Catholic just means for general yeah. consumption, for everybody. This involves everybody. Universal. So, what other letters are Catholic letters? First and Second Peter. First and Second Peter. First, second, third, John. First, second, third, John. J Jude. Jude. Okay. 
So there's seven of them, okay? Seven of these so-called Catholic epistles, small ones, they're not, they're not big letters, but they're not written by Paul, they're not written by Luke, these are, but they're written for the general consumption of the church. Um, so how did the early church deal with these little letters? Did they accept them? Did they not accept them? Do we know? I'm sorry, I'm doing most of the talking here. Well, by the third century, that would be starting around 200 B.C., 170 years after Jesus died, the book of James was generally accepted by Christian churches. Arrhenius, who lived between 130 and 200, clearly quoted from James 2, verse 23. Tertullian, who lived from 160 to 225, called Abraham a friend of God, which is a phrase found only in the book of James in the New Testament and in a couple of places in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, and comparing Isaiah 41, verse 8. So these are the kind of things that make people think, okay, you know, these early authors apparently read the book or they knew about it. Origen, who lived from 185 to 254, referred to the epistle of James on a number of occasions, making some of the clearest, earliest, and direct quotations from the book of James on one occasion, he originally, uh, Origen actually mentioned the phrase, the book of James. So that's a little bit of the background history. However, we need to be honest to say that some other early church leaders mentioned the fact that the authenticity of the book of James and its authorship was still disputed. And I don't know, these are people who lived later. Gregory Nazianzen, who lived from 329 to 389 A.D., actually called James the brother of God. So think about the implications of that. Finally, in 397 A.D., the Council of Carthage gave its approval to the book of James, ratifying it as a canonical book of the New Testament that cemented its place in Scripture. Well? I think it's interesting that Josephus mentioned him, too. Yeah. Flavius Josephus, who lived from 37 to 100 A.D., mentioned that James was the bishop of Jerusalem and that he was later stoned to death probably around A.D. 62 or 63. What do we know about that? Well, th that raises the question. I'd like to have your opinion. Do these early church leaders, these people who gave their lives for Christianity, even though they were not apostles, we're now talking about first generation, maybe second generation after the apostles. Should we believe what they've written? Well, it, why wouldn't we? I mean, one reason why we would is that it kind of meshes with everything else, isn't it? Okay. I don't think you would ignore it. <laughs> Obviously going to be something worth looking at in there. Okay. Just don't brush it off. Okay. Now, who was Flavius Josephus? Uh, historian. He was a guy who actually, at one time, was trying to be a political leader against the Romans. And when he realized that wasn't going to be successful, what did he do? He switched sides and be became a historian for the Jewish, to tell about Jewish affairs among the Romans. And he works. And he was the one who tells us about. Um, a number of the battles, well, even the fall of Jerusalem. He was a Jewish general that changed sides, and he actually ended up very close friends with Titus. Yeah. And uh, he, he played on the Romans, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They uh, believed in uh, fate, but that's the wrong word. But he, he, he followed it through, and in, yeah. in Josephus worked his way up in the very high circles in Rome later. Yeah. Well, Josephus tells us that around the year AD 62 or 63, and it, this is what happened, and I'm, I'll quote him. This is from Ecclesiastical History. Uh, it was quoted later uh, in Antiquities, and uh, Eusebius quotes it in Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, verse, uh, chapter 23, verses 21 and 24, through 24. Festus was now dead. Remember, Festus was one of the people who took Pilate's place a couple down the line. And Albinus, who was coming next, was but upon the road. In other words, there's a temporarily no Roman leadership 
in Judea. Okay? So he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was, brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So at this point in time, because there was no sort of Roman authority keeping his hand on the lid, the Sanhedrin felt that they could, you know, they could just dispatch people if they wanted to. Okay? Well, Eusebius also tells another story, preserves a narrative from Hegesippus, another early Christian, which gives us the lengthy story of the martyrdom of James in Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, 23, pages, uh, 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 verses 4 to 18. And I hope that you find this interesting. If you're interested in this material, it's available on our website, you know, theox.org, T-H-E-O-X.org. I spent a lot of time pulling together this historical material on, on James. Eusebius tells us that the death of James took place just before Vespasian besieged the city of Jerusalem. So they went up, now these are his words, quoting, so they went up and threw down the just man and said to each other, let us stone James the just. Okay. So, you know, we, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I clearly have the idea when someone says someone's going to be stoned, the idea is you're going to, he's maybe kneeling on the ground there and you're going to throw stones at him until he's dead, right? That's not what they did in, 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 in Jerusalem. They would take these people up to a high oh. point in the temple and throw them off yeah. and hoping they would be dead when they hit the ground. If they were not dead when they hit the ground, then they would go on and go, he goes on to say, and they began to stone him for he was not killed by the fall. But he turned and knelt down and said, quote, I entreat thee, Lord God our Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Suppose James died more or less the same way Jesus did. And while they were thus stoning him, one of the priests of the sons of Rechab, the son of the Rechabites, who are mentioned by Jeremiah the prophet, cried out saying, cease what you do, stop stoning him, in other words. The just one prayeth for you. And one of them, who was a fuller, took the club with which he beat out clothes and struck the just man on the head. And thus he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot by the temple, and his monument still remains by the temple. He became a true witness both to Jews and Greeks that Jesus is the Christ. And immediately Vespasian besieged them. And Vespasian, what's the story of Vespasian? Wasn't he Titus father? Mm -hmm. There's a linkage there somewhere. Titus, his father, Josephus played on the fact that the Titus' father had a vision and, and, and Josephus said, you're going to be the next one in Rome in charge. Mm -hmm. But I, I might be wrong with Vespasian. There was somewhere in there. Yeah. But what did Vespasian do? Wasn't he the one that led the first attack on Jerusalem? Yeah. Remember Jesus said when they attacked Jerusalem, flee from the city? And nobody can seem to explain, but... Vespasian comes and he attacks the city and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the Roman yeah. army scattered and the Christian says, that's our signal. They got out of Jerusalem. Four years later, Titus came back suddenly and just completely destroyed every, besieged the city, basically killed everybody inside, flattened the city, tore down the temple, took all the gold. He even left some people behind to make sure that every building was torn down. I think Vespasian got called back to Rome. Well, Jerome, who was the one who translated the Latin Vulgate, so he's the, he's the translator of the official Latin Vulgate, which is the official scriptures for the Roman Catholic Church even up until today, who lived from 342 A.D. to 420 A.D. Jerome tells us of the holy manner of James's life and the history of his death as a martyr. He is said to have ruled the church in Jerusalem for 30 years up to the time of his death. Now, what did we read about uh, what happened right after Stephen was killed? What happened to most of the Christians? Well, they scattered. They were scattered. And a fierce, op a fear, per fierce persecution came upon all the Christians in Jerusalem. So here's someone, what's he, what's he doing? 
He's in charge of the Christian church through all this very difficult time. So now, Jerome says, he was cast down from a pinnacle in the temple, his legs broken, but still half alive. Raising his hands to heaven, he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then struck on the head by the club of a fuller, such a club as fullers are accustomed to wring out garments with, he died. Any of you know how fullers use a club to wring out garments? Yeah. This, I knew they whitened stuff out, full as earth, but it's the first time I'd heard of a club. Yeah? Is, uh, he's, he's a fairly old man at this time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Should have been probably close to 70. Yeah. So I'm do you guessing. think he, in the role of the church in that time, do you think he was given that because he had insight from viewing Christ from a, as a boy all the way up into his death, whereas the disciples only got three years and he had a... Well, that's a good question. And, yeah. and what, other, what other reasons might he have been chosen? Can you think of any other reasons why he might have been chosen? A relation? Maybe just because he had been related to Jesus. That's a possibility. What other reasons can you think of? He could have been married with a family. Well, probably was. That wouldn't necessarily make him eligible to be. No, but know. he would have. He would have been stable and settled. You might yeah, say. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Can you think of any other reasons? It's possible he was chosen because the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem weren't so familiar with him, so it'd be easier for him to move around in Jerusalem among church members without being detected. I'm, I mean, that's a sort of a negative kind of way to put it, but that's possible. We don't know for sure why he was chosen, but clearly he was one of the major leaders for the Christian church in those very difficult times. But there's still something a little disturbing about his leadership. We applauded him for what he did in Acts 15. He said, we will not require the Jews, I mean, we will not require the Gentiles to go through all the Jewish ceremonies, circumcision, all that kind of stuff to become Christians, okay? And he stood firm. He wrote a letter. But what happened about, uh, what would this be, 15 years later when Paul came to Jerusalem and brought that huge offering from the Gentiles? And they poured out all that money at the feet of James. And what, did the, what did the leaders in the church at Jerusalem say to Paul? Wonderful. Hmm? Wonderful. Well, that was the first thing they said. <laughs> what did they say next? Um, Prove you're a Jew. Prove you're a Jew. Go and do this ceremony. Shave your head. Go into the temple. Go with these other people. And what was the result? Ultimately, the arrest of Paul. Yeah. And eventually his death, right? Where was James standing up at that point? Shouldn't he have stood up for Paul? Well, let's talk, let's talk, let's move now to say a little bit about the book of James. Many modern Christians look down on the book of James because of the statements of Martin Luther. But we cannot depend on Martin Luther for all our understanding of Christianity. Remember, Martin Luther said what? He thought that, Luke, that James was all about works while Paul was all about faith. And so he called the book of James what? A book of straw. An, apostle, an epistle of straw. An epistle of straw. Ellen White has some few words to say about Luther. Luther, and, and she had great praise for Luther, but she says, Luther and his co-laborers accomplished a noble work for God, but coming as they did from the Roman church, having themselves believed and advocated her doctrines, it was not to be expected that they would discern all these errors. It was their work to break the fetters of Rome and give the Bible to the world. And who was the first one to translate Bible into modern European language? Luther. Luther, in German, didn't he? Yeah. Um, yet there were important truths which they failed to discover. Can you think of one? Immortality of the soul. Immortality of the soul. Can you think of another one? Sunday. Sunday sacredness. 
and grave errors which they did not renounce. Most of them continued to observe the Sunday with other papal festivals. They did not indeed regard it as possessing divine authority, but believed that it should be observed as a generally accepted day of worship. Volume 4, Spirit of Prophecy, page 180, paragraph 1. Their paradigm that they were raised in uh, affected and infected their whole thinking and has for yeah. several hundred years. Yeah. Well, since Martin Luther said those sort of disparaging things about James, the book of James, what does the book of James say? Look at, look at James 1, verse 3. For you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. What's he talking about? Faith, right? Look at chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God chose the poor people of this world to become rich in faith and to possess the kingdom by which he promised to those who love him. Okay? And look at verses 22 and 23 of chapter 2. Can't you see his faith and his actions, talking about Abraham, can't you see that his faith and his actions work together? His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scripture came true that said, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. And there's that friend of God idea. Okay? So what are all these verses so far have talked about what? About faith, right? And then look at James 5, verse 15. This prayer made in faith will heal the sick. The Lord will restore them to health, and, their, and the sins they have committed will be forgiven. Wouldn't it be correct to agree with Jesus that faith produces works? Well, yes. How are you going to... It's possible to have somebody say they have faith, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, well... How would you know? I mean, if there's going to be a judgment, you're going to just take the Lord's work, word for it because he can read his mind, or is there going to be some other evidence out there to show that he had faith? Well, to have good faith, you must have a healthy tree. I'm sorry, to have good fruit, you must have a healthy tree, Jesus said. This is Matthew 12, 33. If you have a poor tree, you will have bad fruit. A tree is known by the kind of fruit it bears. Doesn't that fit with the book of James? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, in actual fact, the small book of James refers to faith many more times than it talks about works. Shouldn't it be shown by our faithful Bible study, prayer and witnessing and loving and caring for others, especially family members and our uh, other believers? Isn't that the way we're supposed to show our faith? Sounds like it to me. Well, there's one thing that troubles people about the book of James. Look at James 1, and this time I'm going to go back to the King James Version. What, what do you, listen to this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Anything about that that worries you a little bit? The twelve tribes? Who are these 12 tribes? Um, you could kind of assume that they're Jews. Well, it sounds like he's, he's writing to Jews, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to the 10 tribes way back in, you know, 721, 722 B.C.? They, got lost forever. they disappeared into history, right? Olivia. We don't know what happened to them. So why is he talking about the 12 tribes? Well, probably the ones in the future, in the figurative sense. Would he be writing only to them? He says he's writing to the 12 tribes. It, he wouldn't have had, got a hold of Revelation, would he? No. Revelation hadn't been written for... 300 more years. Several hundred more years. 30, 30, so. 30, 30 plus years yet. Well, that, that worries a lot of people. It sounds like he's writing a very, you know, just to a select group. You people over here, you're Gentiles, you don't listen to this. You people who are Jews, now this is for you. It sounds a little bit like that, right? Well, why would he do that? 
Is it a figure of speech that he's referring to? I was going to say figurative. Okay. There's a couple of places that would seem to suggest that. Look at Acts 11, starting with verse 19. Some of the believers were scattered by the persecution, which took place when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, and so forth. So, it here's the believers who were scattered. So, the groups who were scattered were known as believers. And look at 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 12. But you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation. Who's he writing to? He's writing to a relatively small group of Christians that are scattered here and there, hiding because they're practicing something that's against the law, right? And how can you call him a holy nation? God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God and so forth. So one explanation for his words are that the early Christians thought of their people as a, like an, almost a nation within a nation or a nation scattered out to other areas. And so it would be appropriate to refer to them something like the 12 tribes. 12 tribes could have been a kind of a, a code word for believing Christians. That's one possibility. There's another possibility, and that's that because James was writing very early in the history of the Christian church, there still were very few, very few Gentiles who had become Christians. So virtually all the Christians were still Jews. How about the, 12, the, the apostles that went out? Yeah. And referring, and maybe it was kind of an encyclical letter to, to them. Uh, yeah. You know, who knows how. That's a possibility, yeah. 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 The 12 followers, except for Judas. Well, in the few seconds that we have left in our, in our time, we think back to Acts 15, with a big to-do that would happen because of baptizing Gentiles. Where did, how would James stand on that subject? And we know that he, he, stand, he stood faithful for the Jews, and he was, he was a true Christian leader. In closing, I would like to mention the fact that one of the ancient further people writing about him called him a man with camel's knees. What do you suppose that would mean? Nobby. He spent a lot of time on his knees in prayer. Mm. Modern Christians have called him old camel knees. So think about that the next time you read, and through this quarter as we read the book of James. Hope you've enjoyed our discussion.